And now we're going to talk about behavior modification in the shelter. And really, the stress reduction and, and the enrichment is all behavior modification, you know? Um, but we're going to talk about some behavior modification here. Now, behavior modification in the shelter can be very tricky because the shelter environment is not terribly conducive to effective behavior modification when we're, when we're talking about trying to modify problematic behavior. We're not talking about simple enrichment. We're not talking about simple training. We're talking about modifying problematic behavior. Um, you, if you want to start a program at your shelter, you're going to need somebody on staff with some knowledge of behavior or that's going to do some research on this stuff. You're going to have staff time to implement the programs and you're going to have to have good monitoring and record keeping so that you can keep track of your program. And so it, this is not for every shelter to really dive into. If you feel like you have the time and the resources, you can do it. Where do we draw the line on who we work with and what we work with in our shelter will depend on a lot of things. It depends on your resources, you know, your knowledge, your skills, um, time and money. Do you have foster homes to help some of these dogs that perhaps before you weren't going to try to help? And, or, you know, good relationships with rescue organizations. Who are your adopters? Are your adopters people that will say, oh, yeah, I'll continue with this program? Because you're not fixing anything in the shelter. You're getting it started. Your adopters are going to have to continue the work. So who are your adopters? Think about it. Your community environment is also um, something you need to consider. Are you rural or are you urban? If, you, if you're going to try to you know, put out a dog who's dog reactive and you want to work on his dog reactivity in the shelter, but you know it's not going to completely generalize out to the world and you live in an urban area where he's walked down the streets with other dogs every day, maybe that's not such a great idea. But if you live in a more rural area, maybe it is. So th these things can come into play too. The size and breed of the dog can make a difference and whether you work with a certain behavior problem or not. And of course, the behavior in question. You know, what are we talking about here? Okay, so I'm going to start this behavior modification with talking about the under-socialized dogs. And you know, socialization is that process of being exposed to all the things that you're going to encounter in life. And all animals have a time in their infancy when they're open to learning about this. It's very important for survival. And the period is called the critical period for socialization, and that in dogs is from 3 to 12 weeks. And socialization is very, very, very important so that we can have a stable dog. We have to socialize dogs. But unfortunately, not all dogs are socialized really well. And so we have oftentimes unsocialized dogs end up being fearful and sometimes even aggressive. And Many shelter animals do suffer from a lack of socialization. And now we're doing a lot of southern transporting up in Massachusetts, and a lot of unsocialized dogs are coming up. There is hope for under-socialized dogs to improve with remedial socialization, but that said, it's much harder the older the dog is. So if we're talking about a six-month-old dog, you know, we, we might have a good shot at doing good remedial socialization, getting somewhere. We're talking about a two-year-old dog that's never lived in a human home, it comes from a hoarder situation, it's going to be a lot more challenging. Okay. So remedial socialization, uh, the best option for this is, of course, to get the dog into a foster home. Okay, because in a foster home, the dog is going to be able to experience what life with humans is. Now, maybe you don't have a ton of foster homes and sometimes it's not possible. And if it's not possible and you want to work on some remedial socialization with your, your little unsocialized dogs, we, what we want is we want lots of extra time given to this dog for confidence building and exposure to the world. But we want to make sure that we go slowly. You know, we don't want to just overwhelm this, this under-socialized dog with the world because that'll make them worse. So we have to go very, very slowly when we're exposing an unsocialized dog to the world. And think about that. Now, fearfulness versus under socialization. Sometimes a fear, the dog is fearful because he's unsocialized. Okay? So he wasn't exposed to all the things he's supposed to be exposed to, so now he's afraid of everything. But sometimes a dog can be genetically fearful, and he could have been exposed to lots of things, but he's still fearful. 
And sometimes fearful dogs are that way because they learned that certain stimuli, people, whatever, are dangerous. And so maybe the dog is not genetically fearful and he got good socialization, but he had a really bad experience with somebody. And now he's afraid of, of that particular kind of person. Is there help for these fearful dogs? Of course there is. If the dog has not learned to use aggression to deal with its fear. Fear aggressive dogs, dogs that are gonna bite you when they're afraid, um, are dangerous dogs. So we're, we're gonna draw a line there with dogs that are using aggression. What does a fearful dog need? Calm social interaction with people, non-threatening exposure to the world, lots and lots of confidence building. And if we can identify what they're afraid of, a particular thing they're afraid of, and not they're just afraid of the world, we can do some systematic desensitization and counter conditioning. These are the behavior modification procedures that we use. So systematic desensitization is when we expose the animal to the scary stimulus gradually, <coughs> slowly increasing the stimulus strength over time. So that's what systematic desensitization means. Counter conditioning is when we change the dogs or cat or whatever, animals, emotional response to the stimulus by pairing it with something good. So if we put these two things together, that's how we can modify some behavior. So for these fearful dogs, calm social interaction, uh, non-threatening exposure to the world, as I said, confidence building. How do you build confidence in a dog? Well, I like to use clicker training, actually, because um, positive reinforcement training teaches the dog that they can earn things by performing behavior, and that will build their confidence. And so positive reinforcement training can go a long way. Okay, so here we have this little fearful dog in a cage, and he's really not doing real well. He's really shaking and drooling and panting, and he's, uh, you know, he's really not coping too well with this environment. Okay, so the behavior modification for fearful cage behavior, like the one we just saw, if we have everybody carrying treats, and we put signs on the cages of the dogs that are fearful and need this kind of behavior modification, and everybody tosses treats as they pass by. Okay, at first without looking at the dog, then with a second of eye contact, and later bending and giving them a little bit more eye contact. So it's very simple. What would it look like? It would just simply look like this is step one. You just walk by and you toss the treats. You haven't got, put any social pressure on the dog. You just walk by and treats fly in. The dog probably won't eat the treats for a little while if he's that fearful, but they came flying in when somebody walked by. Step two, when he's doing a little better, we might turn and face him, toss the treats in and walk away. Okay, so now we're giving him a little bit of frontal contact. And this is over the course of many sessions, not just in a row like I'm showing you here. You might do step one for three days, step two for four days, step three for ten days. But the idea is to gradually do systematic desensitization and counter conditioning. Okay? And we're going to teach this dog that humans approaching the cage predict flying in treats. Okay? Now, the potential to get the visitors on the mix, if you put this fearful little dog on the adoption floor, um, you can have treat containers hanging on the front of the cage. What I like to do for the fearful guys is have a PVC pipe rigged up and on the outside, and, and the elbow goes into the inside, and there's a sign on the, on the uh, cage that says, please drop a treat down the pipe. And the reason I like doing this for the shy ones is because it keeps people from staring at the dog because they're so interested in, oh, and they, they get the tree, and then they're like putting it in the pipe, and they watch it go down, and like, oh, that was fun. And it takes all the pressure off the dog. And so, and kids really like doing it too. And what we're doing is we're having our visitors help us counter condition the dog. Uh, fear beyond the cage, of course, if we can identify what the dog is afraid of, and we have the time to do behavior modification, we might be able to change some of those negative feelings. So let's say we identify a dog as afraid of men, especially men wearing a hat. Sorry, guys. It's always my example, because it is pretty common. Okay, what would a desensitization and counter conditioning program look like? First, a man without a hat stands beyond the critical distance. That's the distance where the, the dog visibly gets fearful. 
And as soon as he appears, you start giving the, the dog some treats. Now, if the dog doesn't eat the treats, it means you need to get better treats or get the guy farther away. Okay? The man disappears and all the treats disappear. Then the man reappears and the treats reappear again. Okay? We're doing basically Pavlovian conditioning. See man get treat. See man get treat. Man disappears, treats disappear. Okay? And we repeat this over and over and over again until the, the, the dog starts anticipating. He sees the man, he's like, there he is again. Did I get my chicken? Okay. And ever so slowly, the man is going to move closer and closer o over several sessions okay, as we continue to do this process. Um, and we need to repeat it with now, repeat it with the man wearing a hat. So we're using distance to systematically desensitize the dog to the sight of the man, moving the guy closer each time, and we're counter-conditioning the feeling by the view of the man predicts the treat. Okay? Important things, go slowly, make sure you have extra special treats, and if the dog ever starts acting fearful, you're going too fast, you need to back up. And then you've got to generalize it to different men. Okay. So as you can tell, this process takes very careful planning. And it takes a lot of repetition. And it's important to prevent the man wearing a hat from scaring the dog at all other times. So these are some of the reasons why doing behavior modification in the shelter is really tricky. It's really hard. I'm, I'm telling you what we would do in the perfect world, but the shelter's not a perfect world. I want you to have the information, I want you to think about it, but it's really hard to control everything in a shelter and to have these set up so nice that the dog never gets frightened. And that's really how it has to go. Okay, let's look at a different kind of dog. Those pushy, unruly, low impulse control, control dogs. Okay, they're social, they're friendly, but they're in a pushy, demanding way. And they haven't, you know, they're overly aroused in play. Uh, they don't know how to control their impulses. And you know, there's no wonder that they're in the shelter. Okay, so behavior modification for these dogs, we need, these dogs definitely need to be worked with. It's really important to work with these dogs. Um, they won't be successful in their next home as they weren't in their first home if we don't. So what do they need? They need structure and consistent and clear communication. They need lots of physical and mental stimulation. And they need lots of training and impulse control. So structure and, co and consistent, clear communication, regular walks, training, you know, structure, regular schedule. Everybody communicating the same thing to the dog, such as if you jump on me, all interaction stops. If you pull on your leash, all movement stops. Now the problem, again, in a shelter, you guys as a staff are working on it, and then you go and get a volunteer, take the dog, and the dog's jumping all over the volunteer. You've got to communicate it to everybody that interacts with the dog. When he gets mouthy, you're going to scream and all interaction stops. I mean, you've got to set these rules and anyone who works with this dog, it has to be clear and consistent so the dog can learn. Physical exercise, they need walks, they need runs, they need play groups, they need physical exercise. Mental exercise, they, all their enrichment stuff I just talked about, they need to be fed in feeder balls or stuffed Kongs for one and then all this other enrichment too. And they need basic training sessions specifically with impulse control. So what's impulse control? Things like stay. Stay is a great impulse control exercise. Wait, leave it, ignore it. All these things are good impulse control exercises. And the do nothing exercise helps them learn to calm down. This is a Sue Sternberg do nothing exercise. If you've heard of it, I'll show you a little video clip in a second. Okay? So here we have just a, a no jump impulse control exercise. When he jumps up, he hears eh, eh. When he resists the urge to jump, he gets a click and a treat. And it just teaches him, look, no matter how much you want this, jumping is not the way to get it. All right? I like to teach dogs to drop it when they have impulse control issues. So we start by not getting him real engaged in the game. Let him chew, of course. And then when he just starts pulling, I show him a treat. When he drops it, I pair the word with the behavior. Okay? So I want to teach him, look, I'm going to play with you, but you need, to, you need to drop it when I say drop it. And so the only way to do that is to teach it up front. And that's how you can, can get this dog to have a good outlet, but have some impulse control about it. 
This is Sue Sternberg's do nothing exercise. So the idea is you have these hyper aroused dogs and you take them into a room, you, you sit there and hold them on a short leash and kind of ignore them when they jump all over you. And you just wait until the dog lays down. It's the only time he gets any kind of social interaction is when he finally lays down. And if you do this day after day, pretty soon you go into the room and you sit in the chair and the dog lays down at your feet. And now the dog's learning when he's with people, it's not always about getting aroused. So see how Brian doesn't touch him until he starts, he lays down. Okay? Great exercise. Now, dogs with handling issues. So during the behavior evaluation, at least the one that I do, we do lots of handling. We stroke their side, we pick up their back leg, we tug on their tail, we look at both ears, we pull on their collar, we wipe them with a towel, and we give them a hug. It's a lot of stuff that we can identify any kind of sensitivities. And some dogs exhibit discomfort with some of this stuff. They might struggle, they might whip their head, they might stiff and freeze, growl, snarl, snap, lunge, bite, lots of behavioral responses to this stuff. Um, they might show these behaviors because they're under-socialized to handling. They might show them because they had a bad experience with handling. Or maybe they're painful or ill. So if you suspect that the dog has an illness, an ear infection, a painful ear infection, or a torn ligament because you pick up his leg and he screamed, or whatever, get him medical attention for sure. If the dog doesn't appear to have any medical issues and he didn't bite you during the handling, you might consider doing some behavior modification, considering everything else about the dog. If he has one little sensitivity, maybe we're going to say, yeah, I think we can work on this in this shelter. If he's got all kinds of problems, you might want to reassess. Most times when shelters start behavior mod programs, we start small. Like the dog has to have one very specific, very mild behavior, and we're going to work through that and gain our confidence in how these procedures work. And of course, this talk is not meant to give you everything you need to know to start a program. It's just a, like a little taste. Okay? So we would use systematic desensitization and counter conditioning to help him feel differently about the handling that he's uncomfortable with. So let's say the dog, when you touched his tail, he whipped around and he growled. Otherwise, a nice dog didn't show any other behaviors of concern. Okay? Um, so he obviously has t a tail issue. So we're going to systematically, by starting at the back, starting on his back, not his tail, work our way down to his tail and desensitize him to being touched while counter conditioning him with a special treat. Okay, so what it would it look like? Touch his back, give him a treat. Repeat that several times. Touch farther down his back, give him a treat. Touch the base of the tail, give him a treat. Touch the tail, give him a treat. Have several people go through the process. Have them do it inside, outside, in the kitchen, in the lobby. You've got to generalize it. So we worked with a dog when I was doing a rotation with the interns who had this exact behavior. He did not like his tail touched. So we worked on it. So we're at the base of it. So as soon as she touches, she clicks and lets him know he just earned a reward. Okay, and then we generalized it, so now Brian takes over, different person. And so again, it, it has to be mild and it's got to be, that's his one sensitivity and we might be able to work him through that. Okay, how long will this take? It depends. It depends on the severity of the behavior. It depends on the amount of practice the dog has had. How long has he been doing this? How long has he hated this tail being touched and how long has he whipped around? And the number of sessions uh, per day or week that you do at your shelter. You do this three times and then you don't do it again. He's probably not going to be happy about someone touching his tail next week. And, it ha and what happens during the time when he's not being worked with? So again, are there kids yanking on his tail and all that kind of stuff? Hard to control the environment at the shelter. All right, now we're moving into resource guarding. Okay, so during our evaluations, no matter what kind of evaluation you, we use, you use, we look for both food bowl and possession aggression in our tests. And responses can range. They can range, range from mild guarding, eating more fast, eating more, more intensity, blocking the hand, blah, 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 to moderate guarding, to severe guarding. We see, we see the whole range. So who do we work with? In my opinion, most shelters are only going to work, if they work with this at all, with mild resource guarding. Okay, because resource guarding um, is, 
is really a dangerous behavior, especially around kids. And you really need to work on it a long time and you need to generalize it a lot to be safe. Um, an inappropriate response from an owner can make the guarding worse, and most owners punish resource guarding, and this is the problem, is that you send a resource guarding dog home, and then it happens to them, and they punish it, and they just make it worse, because they prove to the dog that people near their stuff is not safe. Behavior modification, again, doesn't generalize well, and it, dogs are exposed to things that are worth guarding all the time. So use good common sense. This is why I say we should work with mild guarding. Now there are, like the Center for Do Shelter Dogs in Boston is working with some severe sh guarding. And I think Dr. Weiss is working with more severe guarding. These are really good, well done pro programs with veterinary behaviorists doing the work. We're talking about your shelter, okay? I want you to, I, it's great that they're doing that work and I love that work, but don't think that you can just take that program tomorrow and start doing it. Start slowly, okay? Build your confidence. If you decide to work with a resource guarding dog, never assume that the, the behavior is fixed, regardless of how well the dog does. You want to have someone else uh, retest the dog periodically to, to see what's going on. Um, and never adopt a resource guarding dog out to a family with young children, no matter how well they do during your behavior modification. It's just not safe or wise. So behavior modification for food bowl guarding, and so that, you know, both the ASPCA and the Center for Shelter Dogs has protocols that you guys can get, and they're great. This is my little very simple protocol, um, and, and really the more elaborate stuff can be very helpful for you. But step one is just hand feeding the dog, teaching the dog that you deliver the food. A human delivers the food. Step two is while they're eating, you approach at first far away and toss a hunk of chicken and slowly, gradually get closer and closer. Then you can really start working with the food bowl itself after things are going well. Put down an empty food bowl and delivers food in installments. So you put the empty food bowl and then you just give him a handful and then he eats that and he looks up at you and says, that's all I get? Oh, you want me to give you more? Okay, and you just work through that. And I'm, going, I'm buzzing through this stuff, but you, you'll get this on the, the PowerPoint. Okay, and, and then, you know, you would repeat step three, but pick up the empty bowl in between. Step five is approach the dog, then pick up the bowl. So there's these protocols we do, that step by step. How long you're at each step depends on so many factors. Depends on the dog, depends on how much you, you can do it. You might be on step two or step three for two weeks. Who knows? Okay, but just, just a little example of the approach and toss the... This dog showed some minor food bowl aggression. Just approach, toss the chicken. So we want them to look up and be waiting for that chicken to come flying. And that's what they learn. Oh, here comes somebody, and here comes that chicken. Okay? And then through your sessions, you get closer and closer and closer. So behavior modification for possession aggression, we need to teach, and again, I'm talking mild possession aggression, Teach the dog two very important skills, leave it and drop it, okay? You also can do the counter conditioning. We just saw the food bowl. If they have a bone, you walk to within six feet, toss, toss a piece of chicken. The idea is to make him feel better about your approach when he has his bone, not to think that you're gonna take it away. But leave it and drop it are really important. So drop it, dog has something in his mouth. The process, when he has something in his mouth and we start with something he doesn't guard, we don't start with the pig ear, we start with a toy, a paper plate, something, and we approach him and we show him the treat. When he spits it out, we say drop it. We want to pair the word with the action. That's how they learn words. Okay. And we repeat this until he knows the cue and we'll, we'll drop on command and then we repeat it with item after item after item. So he'll drop anything. Okay. So we start with a toy. That one, he, he's like, oh, well, which one do I want? <sighs> okay, <laughs> all right. Now, leave it is when a dog is near an item, you know, with these resource guarding dogs will hover over an item, you want them to walk away from the item. Some people think of leave it and teach leave it as you put it in front of them and they don't touch it. I call that ignore it. Leave it to me is walk away from it, okay? The process is you get an extra special treat, you lure the dog away, you say leave it, again, repeat it until they learn the cue and then you repeat it over and over again with different items. So this dog is tethered. 
The item is just out of her reach. I lure her away. OK, lure her away at first so I can teach her the word leave it. And we work and work and work until I can be on the other end of the room and say, leave it, and she comes away from it. And then you work and you go through a progression of hierarchy of items until you get up to the stuff that she is currently guarding. So how long will this take? As I said before, it depends on the severity of the behavior, the amount of practice the dog has had guarding its resources, the number of sessions per day you do, and what happens during the other times when you're not working with the dog because you're in the shelter environment. Also important to consider food bowl aggression is easier to modify than possession aggression because it's a very specific event. It's a food bowl given twice a day. Very controllable, manageable. Dogs who exhibit possession aggression can show possession aggression over anything they feel is worth guarding. I have the, in my clients, my gosh, you know, they guard tissues. I have one dog who guards the vomit that the cat spits up. <laughs> so, you know, when you're, do, and when you're doing temperament testing, you know, you test with something really valuable. And I remember one dog didn't show any resource guarding over the, you know, pig ear or some other valuable thing. And then I put him in a get acquainted room with a family and I left and I came, I was like, oh, he really likes to play, play fetch. And I came back 10 minutes later and they're sitting in chairs over here and the dog's on the couch with the ball. And I said, what's the matter? First time he got the ball, he took it up on the couch. They went to get it and he became Cujo. Well, I didn't test him with a t tennis ball. But this is the thing that, you know, this stuff, whatever the dog feels that is worth worth um, possessing. So if you see possession aggression in the shelter over something, doesn't mean, he's, you know, if you work on that, he might show it over other things, weird things, you never know. Even if you work through several items, there still might be something that the dog guards in the future. And behavior modification, again, doesn't generalize really well. So you also want to consider that uh, a dog that exhibits both food bowl and possession aggression has more generalized guarding. Um, so these dogs are going to be more difficult to manage and the behavior modification is going to take longer with these dogs. And the last thing I'll talk about is dog to dog, oh, almost the last thing, the dog to dog aggression. Okay? So dogs exhibiting generalized severe offensive aggression probably shouldn't be considered for adoption. But dogs who exhibit mild to moderate aggression that's non-generalized or defensive aggression to other dogs, you know, and consider for, for uh, adoption, but you also might want to think about working with some of these dogs as well. There's also those dogs that show on-leash dog reactivity. Okay, so they react negatively to the sight of other dogs when they're on their leash. It stems from frustration. It's a type of barrier frustration. And they're not necessarily dog aggressive. I have tons of clients that take their dogs to the dog park, but they can't walk them down the street on a leash without them being Cujo because it's that frustration that they can't get to their friends. So we, d we definitely want to work on this behavior. And we want to tell the, the adopter what we did so that they can work on this behavior as well. I like to use a gentle leader head collar. I use it for a lot of reasons. I use it because you can humanely control the reaction of the dog. Uh, but I also use it because it gives the owner, when I work with owners, a lot more confidence that they can do this because they're usually such basket cases that their anxiety is feeding into the behavior. And so the gentle leader head collar if desensitized well, which is important, um, is a very useful tool when you have on-leash dog reactivity. And so we want to desensitize the dog to wearing it. You want to make sure you fit it properly. Proper fit is so important. And then you want to desensitize them to wearing it. And so this dog got her gentle leader on, and now she's getting treats. Okay, you put it on for a couple of minutes, give her treats, do some behaviors, click and treat, okay? And pretty soon she's associating the gentle leader with getting good stuff and she's moving around and it's not killing her. So after the nerves in her nose desensitize to it, you can then use it to work, do your work. Now this is a clip from Gene Donaldson's work. You know, so this is the before, okay? Reactive dog and this is using the gentle leader. When we humanely suppress the reaction with a gentle leader, it's just a gentle lift up. It's just using pressure. It's not using pain. I do not believe in choking or shocking a dog. In fact, that makes the behavior worse. 
but the gentle leader can be very, very helpful. Now I throw in there um, counter conditioning. Okay, so the management of the behavior is the gentle leader. I use clicker and treats for marking the behavior that we like. So as soon as the dog sees another dog before he starts being reactive, we go ahead and mark that behavior and reward him. If he reacts negatively, we, s we just gently suppress it. Okay, so now the dog has two choices. When he doesn't react, he gets rewarded, which then in turn starts teaching him the sight of another dog predicts goodies, but only if he stays calm. Okay, so here's a session at Tompkins, last time I was in with the interns. So this dog that one of the interns is working was, t was terribly dog aggressive. This is like our third session with this dog. Now she's still looking pretty focused at the dog, but she's not, and I don't have a before on this one, unfortunately, but she was very, very reactive. Okay, so we do this every time the dog sees another dog, and soon he's going to anticipate treats when he sees the dog. That's the counter conditioning. The reactive behavior should eventually go away because there's no longer this internal reward they're getting from acting that crazy. So when a dog has that outward reaction, they get all kinds of internal reward. The surge of adrenaline and the satisfaction of a drive to be that way, all that stuff rewards the behavior. So this process isn't going to make a truly dog aggressive dog safe. It improves leash behavior. So if we have a dog who just has on-leash reactivity from frustration and not truly dog aggressive, you're going to go miles with this. If you have a dog aggressive dog, this is just going to make you be able to walk him down the street without him looking like Cujo. He's still going to be dog aggressive. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now barrier frustration is the last thing I'll talk about. I'm going a little over, I'm sorry. Um, very common problem as we talked about. All the reasons why dogs show barrier frustration, their social nature and such. And they're frustrated and oftentimes it leads to barrier uh, frustration and barrier aggression. So the behavior modification for barrier aggression or barrier frustration, visual barriers again can be very, very helpful. So that's management. Uh, but if you want to go the extra mile, we do desensitization and counter conditioning. So I wanted to show you this little clip. This is an actual visitor to the shelter. I just happened to be standing there with my, sh and watch the dog. And what does she do? Right. So, you know, people don't know any better, so that's just triggering the dog. She bends down, she looks at the dog, it's triggering the dog to be reactive. And this dog was getting worse and worse with time. Another dog who has that similar response to people. So this is just my before tape, okay? Now, so the behavior mod for this cage reactivity, we start by walking by and just tossing treats in, like we show, I showed you for the shy dogs. And then what we're going to do is then we walk by and we start marking calm behavior with our clicker. So I walk by and when he doesn't act crazy, I click and treat. And then I start approaching from a different angle, bend down. So now through that process, and again I don't have the full video for you, I had to cut all this stuff real, real short, but just showing you the basic idea, okay? The idea is to counter condition the emotion, okay? On the adoption floor, you can have little baggies of treats, again, hanging on the, on the front, little cups of treats or whatever, so that people can deliver the treats. Reduces that frustration. People, people uh, predict treats coming in instead of being frustrated. Now, this is a dog that has terrible barrier frustration with other dogs. He absolutely goes nuts. This is the before video. Okay. All right, so what we did, we start by tossing treats in. There's a dog standing over here, just standing. And every time he looks at him, I just throw a handful of hot dogs in. Okay, and I'm going to do that over and over again. He looks up at the dog, hot dogs come flying in. Okay. <laughs> Then we progress to tossing treats in when the dog's moving by. Now, see how he starts to get aroused, but then he's like, oh, treats, treats, treats. And I'm going to throw those treats in regardless of his behavior, because you'll see how this works. Here comes the dog.
this person, the blur walking by is a dog walking, a person walking a dog by. So every time the person walks a dog by, the treats come flying in. Okay, now we switch to that. So now I'm going to walk by, and as I walk the dog by, I'm going to throw treats. <laughs> and then we're going to generalize it to other people. So that's a sh very shortened version of the process that would take probably a couple of weeks. But the idea is you're going to have passing dogs predict good things. And so, you know, if you have everybody on staff and everybody knows, oh, he's the one, you've got to throw your treats in as you walk by with the other dog. Okay, it really make it he made a huge difference for this dog, and you saw how bad his behavior was. Okay, where am I? Oh. All right. So, I, I plead with you to use good common sense with making a decision to work with an animal. Behavior modification takes time, and it needs to be done consistently to be helpful. Uh, you really need to consider whether you actually have the time to plan and implement a program. If you start a program and then you slack off, the dog is just going to revert right back to what he was doing before. Because that's what's best, most practiced. And so you really got to commit to this stuff. You can't just say, oh, today we'll do behavior modification. You got to say, okay, we're going to commit, we're going to start by doing this issue. We, we want to start working with this issue. Don't try to do all of the stuff I, I presented today. Start slow. In all cases, never assume you've fixed a problem. Behavior modification takes a really long time and it's doubtful that in the few weeks you work with it that you ha will have successfully changed the behavior. But you will have started the process. And the great thing is you can say this dog is receptive to behavior mod which means that when you have an adopter and you say, okay, of course it's a special adopter, we've been doing behavior modification with this dog, he's doing really well, but we're nowhere near done and you need to continue it. Okay, so that's another thing you need to consider. Make very careful adoptions and you need to counsel these people so that they know what they're getting themselves into and what's required um, having a dog that needs some behavior modification. And you want to follow up with them on a regular basis so you can provide assistance if they're running into problems. When is it not advisable to work with a dog in a shelter? If the dog has a history of biting in his previous home, if the dog has severe aggression during the evaluation, if the dog exhibits severe aggression during his stay at your facility, or if he is returned for biting. We're not working with those dogs. Okay? You cannot rehabilitate an aggressive dog in a shelter. The shelter environment is just not conducive to the kind of consistent work we need to really work with a severely aggressive dog, okay? And you know, this is true with all of this stuff though, but you know, you're, the staff is only there eight out of 24 hours, and out of that eight hours, how much time is there to do behavior modification? Maybe at most a half an hour with each dog, okay? And there needs to be consistency and good management. Um, you gotta manage the dogs at all other times, which is almost impossible at the shelter. So even owners that come to me as, as, you know, with their own dogs for help find it really hard. They, you know, they pay me good money to come and teach them how to do this stuff, and they really want to do it. This is a member of their family, and they find it really hard to stick to these programs because they're tedious. They take time. They take setups. Okay? This stuff is not easy. So I ask you to please think about it seriously, take it seriously, and be realistic. But do it. You know, start thinking about it, but be realistic about it. And that's the end of this one. <laughs> okay.